uh, welcome to this module. Uh, this module is in continuation with our last module and the focus is on uh, tissue and cell culture techniques, right. So, if we uh, see what we have uh, uh, seen the last uh, lecture, right, uh, we have seen how uh, the what is the importance of understanding the tissue and cell culture techniques right and how they are interrelated when you talk about uh, developing the uh, bioengineering platform or a biomedical device or in terms of medical device then how this uh, uh, tissue and cell culture techniques can be used. Uh, if I go for the next slide and if you see here uh, uh, then you what you see is that how the uh, uh, cell name came into existence. Uh, then we discussed about beginning of the cell theory and then we saw what exactly cell theory means, what is cell culture we discussed right and we discussed three different uh, uh, points you know, or you can say terms, uh, one is uh, in vivo, second is ex vivo and third one was in vitro right. Uh, in vivo within the body, ex vivo when you take out the tissue from the body and you do the experiments, in vitro is when you develop the cells in the laboratory and use the microfluidic chip or any static platform like a uh, transwell to uh, study the uh, uh, tissue properties or a cell properties. Now, further what we developed is what are the types of cell cultures and uh, uh, how we can uh, isolate the cells or how can we culture the cells uh, from a given organ. We also saw some terminologies uh, such as primary cell culture, cell line, adherent cells, confluence, passaging right and then uh, what are the, how the tissue culture process flow works. So, we have seen two different uh, approach, we also seen how the subculturing works and cryopreservation works. So, if you want to preserve the cells for long time what is the process flow correct. So, today what we are focusing on is how, what are the application of this tissue culture, why we should understand tissue culture and how uh, uh, it is related to cancer diagnosis right. So, uh, let us see today. Uh, a tissue culture uh, system is an excellent model system for studying normal physiology, cell biology and biochemistry of cells right. So, for a bioengineering lab right, uh, if I want to work in a bioengineering lab and bio is biology, engineering is engineering laboratory. Now, if you see ex, uh, recently when you talk about bioengineering it is a mix of it is an interdisciplinary branch where the engineers works with scientists right. Now, when I say that that means that um, uh, an electronics engineer working with a biologist uh, or, a, or a mechanical engineer working with a biologist or a uh, you know robotics engineer working with a biologist to uh, mimic a biomedical robots. So, when you talk about interdisciplinary research it is not just about uh, uh, two different fields it is how we can merge the expertise of different labs uh, to work on a particular problem. Let me give you a few examples. Suppose I want to understand uh, of uh, from a given set of drugs which drug would be effective or which drug has a higher efficacy for, uh, for the patient right. If that is my uh, idea I need to understand how the how we can take out the cells uh, from the patient and how can we load the cells, how can we mimic the in vivo situation that can be uh, uh, that can be that can happen only when we have expertise from the cell biologist group. But when you want to understand how the uh, fluid will flow in the body and how can we mimic this in vivo situation on the in vitro platform we require microfluidics and that is why the engineering comes into picture right. Uh, it, it includes the chemical engineering, it includes the material science, it includes the electronics engineering because you, it includes packaging of the device. Finally, what we want to see is we have to control the amount of liquid flowing or drug flowing through the channel such that it infuses into the uh, cells and based on the efficacy, based on the effectiveness of the drug the cells will die or it will sustain. So, if the cell dies we say the drug is more effective. How we know cells are dying? right. Can we create a platform that is what my uh, point about bioengineering laboratory would be where we study different uh, uh, projects with different different problems and uh, there is a inter interdisciplinary research. So, it provides uh, a flexibility in experimenting with the varying engineering parameters I just discussed that are used to design the sensors which will finally, used for uh, bi primary biological tissues. Now, as I said it can be used to understand the effect of drugs, radiation, toxic components onto the cells and tissue 
So, uh, uh, we can use either conventional biological protocol uh, or we can use microengineering devices, microfluidics, MEMS, NEMS, etcetera, right. So, studying mutagenesis and carcinogenesis is uh, another uh, understanding of tissue culture helps us to uh, uh, understand both the problems uh, or to study both the problems well how the uh, car, uh, carcinogenesis uh, works and then we can also understand uh, that this this tissue culture systems are widely employed uh, for large scale manufacturing compounds that are biological origins like vaccines insulin uh, interferon and other therapeutic proteins so, if I want to give you few examples how we can use this tissue culture, let me uh, show it to you uh, few examples here. I will open a new slide okay, and let me show you few examples. Okay. So, suppose there is a equipment called CO2 incubator. CO2 incubator. The parameters within it is 5 percent CO2, 95 percent RH, 37 degree centigrade. So, if you see this, these are the parameters or the environment within the CO2 incubator. What's, what is uh, why it is 5 percent CO2, 95 percent relative humidity and 37 degree centigrade? Because this will help the cells to survive, right. And if the cells are there, if you load the cells in a U bottom plate, right, and you put the media with growth uh, components then the cells will clump together to form a spheroid all right. So, again what is the point? This is a cell culture technique that we have a CO2 incubator, we have five uh, which has the following parameters. Now, these parameters are because these are the same parameters that are used or that is existing within a human body. Right. If you see our temperature is 37 degree centigrade, 5 percent CO2, 95 percent humidity, relative humidity that is how the cells are surviving, the cells are growing. Right. So, if I take these cells and if I want to understand how can I implement a microengineering or a engineering idea to study these cells or to study the drug that is our question. Okay. So, now what will I do? I have something called a trans well. T R A N S W E L L. Trans well consists of a well so this is this is a well right this is a well here and there is a mesh this is a mesh right like this. So if I load my spheroids what is spheroid? Group of cells together forming within the incubator, right. Spheroids, okay. If I load the spheroids with metrigel, what is called? Metrigel, M A T R I G E L, metrigel. What is metrigel? So, uh, when you see a cancer within a body, is always surrounded by extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix. Okay. This extracellular matrix provides the nutrition and the remaining growth hormones to the to the cancerous tissue. So, this matrigel has similar constituents like this ECM. Okay. So, what we are doing is we are growing the cells within the CO2 incubator with the help of cell culture techniques and then this growing of cells and clumping it together forms a spheroid. This spheroid I will take it and I will load in a trans well. 
right and this trans well is having along with uh, the spheroids it has a matrigel all right this much is easy now what i will do now i will load drug here drug here okay and if the drug is effective this drug will diffuse through matrigel drug will diffuse through matrigel if the drug diffuses through matrigel what will happen if the drug is effective this cell let like us say we take a one single cell and there is a nucleus right and if the cell if the drug is effective the cell will lies lies or it is fragmented defragmented it, it broke breaks into pieces ok assume in a very uh, easy language assuming in any very easy language what what I said that cell will get lysed. Now, if the cell is lysed the constituent within the cells will come out. So, we can use two different ways one is called biomarker if I use a biomarker then I can understand when the cell is breaking the fluorescence will change the the uh, there will be creation of light why because we have used a biomarker such that the biomarker will uh, highlight the cells uh, and its cytoplasm or its nucleus. So, if I want if I want to uh, know that uh, this is a cell then I will use something called DAPI D A P I DAPI will stain the nucleus with blue color with blue color. Okay. Let us not go into this detail right now we, we do not worry about this I will, I will teach you when the time comes right now let us understand that this is my uh, current way of understanding the uh, efficacy of drug if the drug is effective the cells would die. Okay. So, the question is every time here the cell and the drug are in a static contact it is a static platform right static there is nothing moving static but if i con if i consider human body is human body static no right the blood continuously flows in our body it is a dynamic system it is a dynamic model then how can we trust a static model when our body itself is a dynamic model so, in, in our body uh, when, when there is a drug is it in continuous contact with the material or with the cells continuous no it is flowing right in entirely through the body. So, can we create a platform that can mimic the in vivo situation situation within the body on to the in vitro. So, this is platform is in vitro because it is in the laboratory. So, such that it can have or it can have the properties of the dynamic model that is our body. So, what can we do for that? We can develop a microfluidic system, microfluidic, all right, microfluidic system, microfluidic system, all right. So, uh, let us see how we can create this microfluidic system, okay. So, I have a channel, I will teach you how to create it, okay. Right now, you assume that with the help of microengineering you have formed a microfluidic channel this is a channel in which you have a drug in a reservoir right and you have created a inlet it flows through here it comes out here and it flows continuously all right now this is your channel which one this is your channel here I have interdigitated electrodes. What is interdigitated electrodes? When you take a metal and you pattern the metal, pattern the metal, okay. I will teach you how to do this one. This becomes our interdigitated electrodes and you can measure resistance. So, these are all metal lines, metal lines, metal lines, okay. Now, this interdigitated electrodes right now if I want to measure resistance of this since the the lines are not sorted they are open. So, resistance would be 
infinite right if i place cells on this along with battery gel i'll have some value of resistance let's say resistance r1 or base resistance rb right when when i'm placing when i'm placing the cells in matrix gel all right so when i place cells in matrix gel onto this chip then i'll have resistance rb all right so let us assume that there are cells in this and there is a group of cells right which are on this interdigitated electrodes all right this much easy so i have resistance rb correct base resistance now if i flow the drug so this is when the drug is not there okay this is when i am not flowing the drug i have base resistance rb now if i start flowing the drug what will happen the drug will diffuse through matrix gel it will diffuse diffusion diffuse right how you can give an example of diffusion easy example is when you lit a, a scented stick right a, in hindi we call agarbatti right then what happens that even in the corner of a room when you lit a scented stick uh, the other corner of the room you will feel the fragrance of that right the phenomenon uh, by which this uh, the the fragrance comes to the another side of the room is a diffusion phenomena right this is how the diffusion occurs this is an example of a diffusion there are many examples of diffusion i'm just giving very easy example all right so now with the with the phenomena of diffusion the drug molecules will start diffusing into the matrix gel and what is there in the matrix gel there are cells in the matrix gel so this drug if you see the slide this drug when it it goes through diffuses through the matrix gel what will happen if i magnify this one right if i magnify this one this is what happens that there is a electrodes there is this matrix gel with cancer cells and the drug is diffusing onto the chip when drug diffuses the cells would if the drug is effective if the drug is effective the cells would lies right it will be defragmented so when the cells are defragmented the constituents within the cell will come out and that causes change in the conductivity now that change in conductivity will change the resistance right so we have a new resistance value initial resistance value was rb you have a new resistance in presence of drug 1 let's say so rd1 correct so if i use the similar platform and flow drug 2 this is drug 1 right now instead of drug 1 if i flow drug 2 then depending on the efficacy depending on the effectiveness of the drug again the drug will diffuse and depending on the effectiveness of the drug again the cells would lies and i will see a change in resistance rd2 this is from second platform you understand okay for each drug we will use a separate platform so if i just uh, delete everything so i can explain you uh, quickly in a easier way what we discussed is that if we have multiple drugs okay we have let's say drug 1 drug 2 and drug 3 correct now we should use a multiple channels multiple microfluidic platform like this and here what we have is interdigitated electrodes
like this correct. We have interdigitated electrodes. Now, this drug 1 is loaded into reservoir 1, reservoir 2, reservoir 3 and we are flowing the drug into microfluidic platform and drug will come back to the reservoir or reservoir. Okay. So, this is my microfluidic platform. What, what I am looking at? I am looking at initially a resistance values which is R B base resistance R B R B when I load cells with material. Okay. This is my resistance value. See without loading any cells I should have resistance infinite. Right. When I load cells with material I have a resistance R B. Right how many cells I am loading depending on the microfluidic platform I can load few thousands of cells per ml about let us say 10,000 10, cells per milliliter hmm? that is our concentration of the cells. Where are the cells we are loaded? We are loaded the cells here in this particular platform. All right. So, now you assume that when we flow drug 1, the drug 1 diffuses through the matrix gel and I will have resistance R D 1. This R D 1 would be different than R B if depending on how effective the drug is. If the drug is effective, the conductivity would increase because the cell would lies. When the cell lies is the constituent within the cell comes out. When the constituent within the cell comes out the conductivity increases and that cause the resistance to decrease. All right. Now, similarly when I flow the drug 2 it diffuses to the matrix gel I will have R D 2. I will flow drug 3 I will have resistance R D 3 right. Base resistance resistance when drug is flowing in each case. As I said, if the drug is effective, the cells would lies and conductivity would be higher, resistance would be lower. So, using this platform, what we can do is we can understand which drug is effective, right? So easy because depending on the change in resistance, we can see that what is the uh, how, how many cells would have been lysed. We have to do uh, multiple experiments to understand the quantification how many cells are lysed, but we can do or we can use this platform as a screening platform. What do you mean screening? Drug screening platform, right. If you see back uh, what I mean is, so now if the R D 1 right resistance R D 1 that is right let write down here R D 1 is less than R D 2 is less than R D 3 right. Then R D 1 is less than R D 2 and also I find that R D 1 is less than R D 3. Then I can see that the resistance of the chip right this interdigital electrodes right is less when I use drug 1 compared to drug 2 or drug 3. If that is the case, then my drug 1 is more effective compared to drug 2 and drug 3. And for the for the cells that we have extracted from the patients, we should use this particular microfluidic platform and the drug 1 or based on the microfluidic platform, we can select drug 1 over drug 2 and drug 3. That means, we have screened which drug would be effective for a given patient. Now, the, the point here is that why we should understand cell and tissue culture because when we take out the cells from the patient right we have to keep the cells alive and how can you keep the cells alive using the tissue culture or cell culture technology. If I want to study the group of cells like spheroid I have to grow the cells within the CO2 incubator again cell culture. You got it. The microfluidic platform is based on microengineering, and that is why it is MEMS based device, micro electromechanical systems based device. Understood? This is just one example out of many uh, on ongoing research in lot of laboratory 
around the world and what we see here is that we can use the platform for drug screening right. Now, I gave an example here that this is a static platform if you see the slide static platform right while all three here microfluidic 1, 2 and 3 is a or are dynamic platforms these are dynamic models right dynamic the trans well this one is a static platform. You understand the difference? The dynamic platform would be better compared to a static platform for studying the drug screening since we can mimic the uh, in vivo situation better in this particular case as we are flowing the media instead of blood. We can also use blood and load the drug and then you flow the drug into the microfluidic chip. So, there can be multiple applications as well ok. So, uh, let us go to the next slide and what we see this is the applications. So, now let us see the advantages of tissue culture technique. The first advantage is the it gives a good control of the environment ok. Then why good control of environment because like I said we can we can grow the cells with a similar environment like our body. Right? Like our body, ok. Now, this is not this is the t, this is Kyoto incubator that helps to uh, control the, uh, the con control the growth and the cell culture right. But when you understand the tissue culture when you get the tissue then the environment when you grow the tissue within the laboratory would be similar to what is there in the body that is how the good control of the environment means it will retain most of the property of how the cells uh, would be there within the body that that is how the, one of the advantages there. Second is that characterization and homogenization of the tissue sample second the third one is the economy scale and mechanization we can al always induce that and finally, in vitro modeling and in vivo conditions we can use in vitro modeling and in vivo conditions right. So, if you see the next slide what are the limitations right. So, the limitations are the cell culture techniques need a great deal of expertise. If there is a contamination if there is a bacterial contamination cells would die. So, we require a semi skilled or not semi skilled actually a skilled person uh, or skilled personnel uh, to operate uh, the uh, uh, tissue culture laboratory ok. So, culturing technique requires a great deal of expertise tissue sample consists of mixture of heterogeneous cell populations because you can you can have different cells and you want to grow a tissue out of it uh, you can use that continuous growing of cells often exhibit genetic instability uh, uh, then so so the, the why this is limitation mixture of heterogeneous cell population because if i want to understand or study a particular cells out of which the tissue is formed i and if i if i have the um, multiple uh, uh, tissue samples may consist of multiple uh, cells like heterogeneity, heterogeneity then the homogeneity is less and uh, then I cannot study a particular cells or group of cells I had to rely on the heterogeneity of the cells. So, which is kind of difficult because I do not want to study that right. So, that is the limitation continuous growing of cells uh, uh, often exhibit genetic instability then we have differences in the behavior of cells in cultured and natural form and finally, it should include proper balance of hormones. So, if you want to see how a tissue culture lab setup looks like uh, this is an example from Caltech. However, um, we have the similar kind of facility uh, uh, in our institute and a small um, facility in my department in my laboratory which I will show it to you as a part of your lab class ok. So, if you see uh, the tissue culture lab setup uh, there is a, a cell counter centrifuge right there are incubators which are shown here there are waste bins right 
then there is a hot room, hot room is to grow the bacteria, there are microscope room, there are quarantine room, then we have a glass sterile uh, where we have laminar flow hoods, we can have storage freezer for nitrogen, uh, uh, nitrogen freezers, uh, these freezers are for the cryopreservation of the cells, then we have a preparation area, ovens, autoclaves, right, uh, wash up area uh, and there are sinks. So, uh, the, the most of the uh, facilities right they are kind of uh, in a clean room environment not really required uh, when you are uh, uh, that depends on what kind of uh, you know applications you are working on but otherwise it is always good to maintain a clean room uh, for this kind of uh, study since uh, you are taking care of uh, removing the bacterial contamination as far as possible the quality of air is better compared to uh, a normal laboratory environment right. Uh, now, there is a hot room, if you have seen a hot room, why hot room is required? Because we have to keep the cells alive at 37 degrees centigrade, if you want to grow the cells, grow the bacteria right, we require a room which can maintain 37 degrees centigrade right. Why we require autoclave? Autoclave is required to clean, wash right, kill the remaining uh, bacteria if any or cells if any from the glassware before we discard into the bio waste uh, bag. Uh, we have O1 to heat the materials of course, you know it, uh, we have several cylinders, we have a nitrogen cylinder, CO2 cylinder, we sometimes also use a compressed air. So, we have multiple cylinders over there and there the, the systems depends on the sterility on non-sterile components, some of the applications requires non-sterile, some of the applications require sterile components right. All the operations in the operation theater they are all sterile, that is why you will see or when you are using a robotic arm to perform the surgery right. You not exactly you are using, uh, what I mean is when the surgeon is using the robotic arm for performing surgery, you see it is covered by lot of plastic and lot of other things right. Only the tip of that is, is access to the environment, this is to maintain the sterility. The most uh, like the, 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 the infection, the bacterial infection generally occurs because of uh, or it, it transmits to our hand and that is why it is very important to keep ourselves sterile as well as the equipment sterile. And like I said bacteria is enemy to cell. So, if you are growing a cancer cell, if you put bacteria cells would die right. So, uh, we need to be <laughs> careful when we are operating or using this kind of facility. Now, if you go to the next one, uh, these are from the equipment and chemicals required uh, for uh, working in a uh, bio safety uh, class uh, and uh, the, the, the class of this uh, bio safety hood is uh, uh, divided into four. First is BSL-1 where we can use a non-pathogenic strains of E. coli. Uh, if there is a BSL-2 which is biosafety uh, level 2, we can use staph or us. If it is biosafety level 3, we can use mycobacterium tuberculosis and if it is biosafety level 4, then and then only we can use uh, Ebola or Marburg viruses and uh, Zika this kind of stuff. Okay. So, this we have will not see in our, our our course, this also we will not see, we will see biosafety level 2, I will show it to you how the system operates in a real situation in my laboratory. Okay. Just to understand it has a LCD display to maintain the flow rate, it has a power lock, waterproof socket, uh, there is a water and gas tap, there is adjustable stand for the height of the uh, for the personal and you have to put a bio safe biohazard label uh, when you are using a bio uh, you know it is always a good idea to put a biohazard label whenever we are working with a biology sample ok. Uh, now, uh, this is what is called bio safety level 2. So, what is this bio safety hood or cabinet? This is where the primary tissues uh, are processed to obtain the culture. It is equipped with all precautionary features to eliminate contamination right as well as hazard to the personal handling the tissue. The different essential parts of biosafety hood are shown in the figure like I said water gas step, LCD display, handle, power lock, biosafety level, waterproof socket and V type intake grill right. Let us see. So, this uh, video uh, that I will play now 
demonstrates how a biological safety hood cabinet works to protect us and uh, how it is helping uh, the laboratory workers uh, by reducing the risk of exposure. Right? Uh, we need to understand the biological safety hood uh, as when we work in this particular hood uh, there is a lab, lab safety protocols which will help prevent contamination of our work and protect us at the same time. So, it is very important you see this video in detail right uh, and then uh, we will continue the next slide. So, let me play the video. This video demonstrates how biological safety cabinets work to protect you, providing protection to laboratory workers, product and the environment while reducing the risk of exposure. Thoroughly understanding how a biological safety cabinet works while following established lab safety protocols will help prevent contamination of your work and protect you at the same time. When used correctly, a properly installed and certified biological safety cabinet provides personnel, environmental, and product protection for work with biological materials, including infectious agents and recombinant DNA. This video depicts a freestanding Class II Type A2 Biological Safety Cabinet, or BSC. It includes HEPA filters for exhaust and supply air, the work surface, the opening to the work surface, the airfoil, front and rear air intake grills, the plenum. The BSC's air filtration system works to keep potentially contaminated air from seeping back onto the worker. Air flows through the window opening into the front grill, through the plenum, then through the HEPA filters. 30% of the filtered air is exhausted. The remaining 70%, which is now HEPA filtered, is recycled back into the workspace. To ensure maximum protection in using a BSC, here are some essential reminders. 1. If the cabinet has been turned off, you must turn it on and wait at least 15 minutes before beginning your work. 2. Set up the interior workspace to work from clean to dirty and work consistently from one direction toward the other to prevent cross-contamination. 3. Place your chair at a comfortable height and in the middle of your workspace to ensure you can reach everything you need inside the cabinet without discomfort. Please keep in mind that you must work at least 10 centimeters inside the BSC. To guarantee uninterrupted airflow, cabinets should never be overcrowded. Overcrowding the BSC can block air grills. Airflow can also be disrupted by sudden or sweeping movements. Slow, direct movements work best. Too much foot traffic can cause problems as well and should be kept at a minimum. If pedestrians are unavoidable, keep people at least one meter from your BSC. And remember to check nearby doors or supply vents to determine if they disrupt the cabinet's airflow. When you have completed your work, any reusable items should be wiped down with disinfectant before removing them from the BSC. Next, the interior surfaces of the BSC should be decontaminated using the appropriate disinfectant for a contact time recommended for the agent used. To be sure, a second decontamination is advisable. In summary, there are a small number of best practices to follow in using a biological safety cabinet. Let's go over them one last time. Work at least 10 centimeters inside of the BSC. Do not block front and rear grills. Too many objects in the BSC can disrupt the airflow. Set up workspace in a direction from clean to dirty. Use slow, direct movements. Minimize foot traffic within one meter of the BSC. Placement of the BSC away from doors and room air supply vents helps maintain airflow. So now, 
having seen the video now you have all the idea that how a biosafety hood works right. Now, I like I said the focus of the today's uh, lecture is to understand the biosaf uh, the cell and tissue culture. However, it is also to understand what are the equipment and chemicals required and such one such equipment like we discussed in the previous example is a CO2 incubator. As you can see the CO2 incubator from thermo scientific is shown right over here and you, you can see here uh, the T75 flask C75 or T25 flask are there along with petri dish along with transwell you can see here right uh, the petri dish with cells loaded uh, here these are T75 flask with cells loaded and uh, there is a media that is why because of the media you can see a, a red color uh, uh, within the uh, within the glasswares. Uh, now, the use of CO2 incubator is that we can grow the cells in a controlled environment and like I discussed the parameters usually are 37 degree centigrade temperature, 95 percent humidity, 5 percent CO2 uh, and this is the core equipment of any tissue culture laboratory. Uh, it gives a control over contamination which is a major issue in tissue culture labs and now the, the size can vary from tabletop to those that can fill an entire small room. Some of the incubators can be programmed to cycle different temperature and humidity level. If you see here we can program different temperature and different humidity level depending on the application of the uh, work. Okay. So, uh, uh, to this let us uh, finish our this particular module and we will continue uh, understanding tissue and cell culture in one more module and then we will finish the uh, this particular topic then we will actually go to understand what exactly is cancer and how can we develop several systems related to cancer right. It is it is more of understanding of uh, how tissue and cell culture laboratory looks like, what are the equipment uh, that are used to maintain the cells and or to grow the tissues within a controlled environment right. Till then you take care I will see you in the next class.